Welcome to your College Bound Kid, a podcast for parents, college counselors, students, and anyone who wants a weekly deep dive into the world of college admissions. Hi, I'm Susan, and I'm a college counselor and have read applications for a small liberal arts college and two research universities. My twins are recent college graduates. I'm Lisa, and I'm a clinical psychologist and college counselor. I have a daughter in college, a daughter in high school, and a son in middle school. After 30 years in Chicago, we recently moved to North Carolina. My name is Mark. I'm a college coach in Atlanta and the parent of two daughters, Karis, a graduate of Davidson College, and she is the founder of the Spanish tutoring company, SpanishHelpToday.com. Joy has a bachelor's degree from the University of Georgia and a master's degree from North Carolina State University. She works in private practice in Raleigh as a mental health therapist. And I'm so blessed to be able to work alongside both my beautiful daughters at School Match for You, a college counseling firm that I founded in 2010. Friends, today is a very special day for me, February 22nd. Had my dad still been alive, he would be 94. Five today. He almost made it to 94. Uh, so I dedicate this special episode to my incredible dad, William Alfred Stucker. Now, this week in the news, we have a very special episode for you, especially if you love our interviews. We have a first on your college bound kid three interviews in one episode. That's right. Now, the first interview I'm really excited about is with Matt Bonser, the Director of Admissions at Colorado College. Matt's a national expert on the gap year, and we're going to be doing a 75-minute deep dive answering every frequently asked question I could think of on gap years and gap semesters. It was so much excellent content that it led me to have another first, a three-part in the news. Yes, that's right. It'll air today, part two, February 29th, in the final segment on March 7th. But if you heard Monday's episode, we have a solution for you listeners who like to hear interviews in their entirety. All three parts of the interview will be live at yourcollegeboundkid.com by tomorrow, possibly even later today. We have three people involved in the production side from when an episode is done until it goes on to the website, sometimes a fourth. So I can't give you an exact time, but definitely later Today or tomorrow, all 75 minutes will be live. And Matt's a repeat guest. You may remember if his name sounds familiar, he did a fantastic session for us on demonstrated interest in predictive modeling about seven or eight months ago. For a question for our listener, as Susan likes to call them, QFL, our QFL will be with Susan. As best and in a great question about how colleges Take into consideration the fact that her son is a talented classical pianist. She wants to know how will this impact his application, especially if he chooses not to major in music. And our second interview is another one I'm really jazzed and pumped about. It's another brand new interview, and it's unlike any interview we've ever had before on the Your College Bound Kid podcast. Hannah and Nora, two scholar match counselors, will be doing a deep dive for us on Scholar Match. Friends, we have a lot of listeners who are passionate about college admissions. I know this because they write in every day. I also believe we have a lot of listeners who love to serve, who love to help others. Well, Scholar Match is looking for hundreds of college counselors to help gifted and talented under-resourced students to get quality college counseling. And they want to train you, even if you have no experience, to be one of their volunteer college coaches. So I'm so excited about the work Scholar Match is doing that I really want to partner with them and have you, your College Bound Kids support them in any way we can about getting the word out about this opportunity for our listeners. Regardless if you've ever helped a student the college process before to get the training so you can make a difference in the life of a deserving student by providing some college guidance. And this interview will also be over the next three weeks. And like the Gap Year interview with Matt Bonser, it'll go live either today or tomorrow in all three parts at yourcollegeboundkid.com under the interview tab. Finally, the last part of the interview 
with Gil Villanueva. Gil is the VP of Neuroma and Dean of Admissions and Financial Aid at Rhodes College in Memphis. And it was in 2020 when Gil came on our podcast as the VP of Enrollment at the University of Richmond that we decided to have Gil and two other national thought leaders, Sam Prouty of Middlebury and Lisa Prescott of University of California, Santa Barbara, do one-hour Q&A sessions with our listeners. And to celebrate Gil coming back after four years, we're bringing back that session and that segment where you come on and just ask your questions to one of the national thought leaders. So Gil will be our first. That'll be March 3rd in the evening. Just go to your collegeboundkid.com, click the events tab, and come pepper Gil with your questions about anything. It may be Rhodes College. It may be just anything about college admissions, but it's not expected to be about Rhodes. And friends, if you guys show up for these sessions in good numbers, I'm going to keep scheduling them with the nation's thought leaders in college admissions. I mean, one reason I love this podcast so much is I get 60 to 90 minutes with the thought leaders in the world of college admissions, the movers and shakers. But why not give you that opportunity? And you can have it by signing up, coming and interacting with these esteemed admissions professionals. But before we turn to my interview with Matt, I don't want those of you who love our admissions tip, admissions vernacular, and big number to be deprived just because we're doing a triple interview. So I'm flying solo today, but here we go. So for our admissions tip, please consider asking a teacher now if you want them to be a recommendation for writer, writer for you. And I'm speaking to our juniors. I have two students who I'm currently working with who are warned by their schools, you better ask your teacher in February or it may be too late. Now, you should check each schools because different schools have different policies on this thing and some schools don't have any policies or procedures at all. But if they don't, why not ask in February? You say, why? Well, many teachers have a policy. They say, I need to have a life as well. I'm usually doing these at home in the evening or weekends. So I'll do 10, I'll do 12, I'll do 15, and that's it. First come, first serve. When I'm full, I'm full. And you don't want to have Miss Johnson say to you, I'd love to do it, but I've already reached my cap. Uh, That's not fun when a student tells me that they heard that from their teacher. So consider asking your teachers in February if you're a junior. For our admissions vernacular, Now, you're going to get two of them this week, RA, and that's not resident assistant, and regular action. So you're going to hear Matt use these terms, actually, and I wanted you to know what he's talking about. So I normally call an application that isn't rolling admissions, early action, or early decision, RD, or regular decision. But RA, or regular action, is just another euphemism for the same application uh, process. And our big number has me totally inspired. There's one thing that gets me pumped up even more than college admissions, and it's philanthropy. And Spelman College has been a transformational college here in the city of Atlanta. And the HBCU, located 15 to 17 miles from where I'm at right now, is celebrating its 100th birthday. Yes, it was birthed in 1924. And in order to celebrate Spelman's 100th birthday, Rhonda Stryker, the granddaughter and founder of Stryker Corp., the medical device company, and her husband, another billionaire, William Johnson, the founder of the Michigan wealth management company, Greenleaf, just committed to give Spelman, that's right, like a drum roll should be called here. $100 million. This is double the largest gift ever given to any HBCU. And $75 million of which is going to go for endowment for scholarships and financial aid for needy students. So if this endowment can generate a 7% return, that's $5 million a year or another way of putting it, that's twenty five k or almost half the cost for one in 10 students in the entire student body. Now, remember, Reed Hastings, the founder of Netflix, and his wife, Patty Quillen, 
They just gave Spellman $40 million in 2020. And at the time, that was the largest gift for financial aid to an HBCU. And then in 2019, Mackenzie Scott, former wife of Amazon founder Jeff Bezos, gave a multi-million dollar gift, and the exact amount isn't clear, but it's believed to be close to that. Uh, Mackenzie Scott totally inspires me. She's in, she's committed to give more than half of her $35 billion of wealth away to philanthropy. And just that year alone, she gave $1.7 billion with no strings attached. A lot of community colleges and HBCUs. And then in 2020, Seth and Beth Klarman gave Spellman $10 million. So Spellman's on fire right now. And it's such a transformational school. I could not be happier. Uh, and by the way, Chelsea Holly, the director of admissions, has agreed to come on our podcast. Okay, friends. Gap years are in the news a lot these days. So let's dive in discussion with Matt Bonser of what I'm calling Frequently Asked Questions About Gap Years for our In the News segment. And now it's time for Hot Topics in the News. Friends, in part one of my interview with Matt Bonser, Matt shares a trend he's observing in admissions this year. He tells us about his role for gap year applicants to Colorado College, tells us what a gap year is and a gap semester. He tells us what percentage of students take a gap year at CC. He shares the reasons why students request to take a gap year. He shares how a student goes about requesting a gap year. He talks about the different ways Colorado College approves a gap year. And finally, Matt talks about how Colorado College emerged as a leader when it comes to providing gap years. Very excited to have Matt back on. Um, He's a listener to our podcast, and he did a great job in the first time we had him here. So we're having him back. Listen and enjoy. Friends, I'm here with Matt Bonser, the is Dean of Admission, Director of Admission, Tell me the title of these days, Director of Admission. Director of Admission at Colorado College. And we're thrilled to have you back because uh, how long was it ago? How long ago did we talk about uh, predictive modeling and demonstrated interest? Uh, it feels like less than a year, nine months, maybe? Yeah, I think I think it was in the like six, eight months ago yeah. range. Well, you should know every time I get asked a question about demonstrated interest now, I send them the link to that like 75 minute conversation deep dive we have oh my gosh i love it i it's actually part of our training program for all the students that we work with they it's like required assigned uh listening for the parents and the students so thank you so much absolutely yeah thank you so much for having me back oh i'm i'm thrilled to have you back and i'm excited about a topic it's a topic that we've wanted to talk about on on the podcast for several years matt and i are going to do a deep dive on gap years gap semesters and he probably won't tell you this, but he's got somewhat of a reputation as a national expert in this in this area. So he's pretty humble. But uh, we've got one of the real pros when it comes to gap years, gap semesters. Uh, but before we get into that, why don't you just tell people briefly a little bit about your background in case they never heard from before or people have a tendency to forget? <laughs> Absolutely. So... Uh, I serve currently as director of admission at Colorado College. I've been in that sort of level of role for close to a decade, but I've been at CC now for just over 25 years. Uh, During that time, I've played pretty much a a consistent role around international recruitment. That's one of the the specialties. And and I am the person at CC that reviews and approves gap years and, and have for more than 10 years. So uh, I get to read all of those narratives as students are listing out what they're hoping to do uh, during their time away. Uh, And uh, I get to live vicariously through their amazing plans. Well, before we dive right in, you know, Matt and I were just chit-chatting as I'm prone to do with all of our, our thought leaders before we record. And we were just having kind of a fascinating conversation with how's the year going, any trends you're seeing. And and he shared a trend with me that I thought uh, our listeners would be very interested in. And so I said, hey, Matt, would you be willing to share that publicly? And he said, sure. So take it away, Matt. 
Sure. And this very much ties into the gap year conversation and in a different way, maybe than I had initially expected, just in terms of the app trends that, that we're seeing in our pool, we've had a pretty significant increase in international applications uh, from Sub-Saharan Africa, from Northern Africa, from the stands, from Southeast Asia this year. And what we're reading in application narratives is that so many of those students have taken a gap year already. And I I think this is an emerging from COVID impact that students didn't feel safe or comfortable in, certainly in 2020, but even in in 21 and into 22, uh, moving so far away from home. And so we're seeing many more students applying for admission from international markets having already completed a gap year or even two uh, before now engaging in the application process. So that's definitely a new trend that we're seeing uh, as we review candidates this year. When you talk with colleagues at any other schools, are you hearing that repeated by them or do you think you're you're kind of a one-off on that one? No, I think we are part of a a bigger trend. Time will tell as, as we publish more uh, you know, public statistics with common data set and iPads. But um, my sense uh, in hearing from colleagues is that many institutions are up in international markets. Presumably, that's part of a similar trend, uh, but we'll, we'll know more as time goes on. Um, and so I, I think you're, you're, you are going to see um, some stability in domestic markets, some increases on the international side that definitely have some impacts in um, who we're reviewing right now um, and yet some some limits on, on who we're able to say yes to. That is our job after all uh, as we're reviewing those students uh, because our, our aid budgets and uh, compositional diversity goals haven't necessarily uh, changed or reflect Uh, the shift in in our applicant pools. Well, uh, it's probably about a month ago on the podcast. You know, I do this big number on a lot of podcasts. And my big number was was an Inside Higher Ed article on the surge in international applicants. And it particularly noted uh, Nigeria and Ghana. Uh, That Nigeria was up 300% and Ghana 1,000%. And it showed India was actually up a lot more than China. So that was just sort of some some general statistical stuff. So nice to see how it's kind of impacting. Always always good to get more apps. You can shape your class. <laughs> of course, it might be more yeah, work on the ways. reading side. On the reading side. Yeah, of course. I mean, that's what that's our job. That's what we sure. we do. We've got to be prepared for it. It's hard to adjust to substantial increases, but um, you know, we want to give students their due, understand where they're coming from, and you know, try and make the best decisions for the college. Well, let's transition to our topic for the day. And I don't want to assume um, anybody knows anything. So uh, why don't we just start out by letting you tell our listeners what a gap year is, what a gap semester is. Sure. In its simplest form, the way we think about it is a span of time, you know, built on the semester structure of, you know, uh, of of the way we've managed our academic lives, at least for years and years, uh, of either a a fall or a fall and a spring where a student, after having graduated from high school or secondary school, uh, chooses not to enroll in collegiate studies straight away, uh, but is is taking uh, some period of time to experience life. And we'll talk a whole lot about what that uh, might entail before beginning college. Uh, there are lots of different ways to approach that, but in its simplest term, it really is, you know, that that break between secondary education and post-secondary studies. If you had to estimate, Matt, just anecdotally, what percentage of the time do you see gap year versus gap semester? Sure. And, and I would say some of this is controlled or managed by our priorities and our objectives, sure. right? So, this is not only the organic interest that students come to us with, but it is also the strategic interest that we approach students with. So we bring in between 20 and 30 gap semester students. We call them winter starts at CC. So 
what is that, 5 6% of an enrolling class comes in mid-year, and then 40 to 50 students will take a, a full gap year where they are seeking that and getting that approval once they've applied for admission. So that is what, 8 10% uh, of our population. We're probably an outlier, especially on the gap year rate. Uh, I think that's a, a much higher number than you're going to find at other schools near us. There are some other students who will apply for admission during their gap year, and we can talk about implications of that, that they, of course, are not asking us for permission because they took their gap year and are then subsequently applying for admission. So I, I suspect if we were to you know, really fully account for them, we're, we're 10 plus percent uh, of our rolling population. And um, we see that as a highly valuable uh, experience. I saw somewhere, and I can't remember where, that that number is closer to 4% at other liberal arts and college, uh, science colleges. Have you seen anything like that? Any data? Yeah, we get we, we get some data. I, I will say um, that that is relatively limited in terms of institutional data sharing. So yes, we have some eyes in that, and I think your your numbers are probably on the right track. Um, but that is very hard to see in nationally published uh, sources. Yeah, the other thing I heard a lot, I mean, I think everyone knows, obviously, that number took a big surge, especially the first year of the pandemic. And then I also heard it took a big surge going back a few years. And I always confuse the name of the two Obama kids, Malia and Sasha. But one of the Obama oh. kids took a gap year. And yeah. I was talking to another director of admission and another CC competitor, um, highly selective liberal arts and science school. And he told me that they saw a real surge that he thought had something to do with that, the publicity uh, that that came out of that. Did you happen to see a surge at all around that time in, in requests? Or... We, we definitely saw that bump during the Obama administration, right? When that was part of the national conversation of, you know, how fixated we are on, uh, you know, where, where uh, specific students are, are going to sure. go to college. Like <laughs> that raises awareness yeah. of what potential paths are acceptable for students to follow. And so, yes, we saw a bump there. We certainly saw uh, a bump of students in what was originally that 2020 entering cohort shift enrollment to 21. Uh, so, yes, yes to both of those things. Which is a good segue into our next question. Uh, what are the reasons that students uh, request a gap year? Well, as you're referencing around 2020, uh, health and safety was a, a key mm -hmm. one, right? As students think about how they want to enter into their collegiate studies and what that environment is going to be like, we had very much a get to yes kind of policy uh, to to help students uh, get to the enrollment term that they were seeking. I think about this in a in a grander way, regardless of the specific plan, is trying to help students envision how they want to close out and reflect upon their secondary education studies and feel like they're really fully finished and done and happy with that experience and how they are going to be fresh and energized and ready to go with their collegiate experience and whether they're you know, staying close to home or going far away, that's supposed to be a, a tough transition and hard work in any college or university. We want students who are really excited to be here when they arrive. And for many students, that can be an awesome summer break with whatever they're doing over those couple of months to get them ready. And in other cases, students are going to feel some degree of burnout of wanting to experience other aspects of the real world before they jump in to their collegiate studies. And this is one of the few times that they can sort of press a pause button a little bit, do some things that they are very excited to do, and really then join our community when they're, when they're ready. So we approach it with a really flexible lens of what they might propose, um, but hoping that they're 
jumping into something that they're very excited to accomplish. And then they're going to bring that expertise and experience to our community and, and, and bring even more than we thought they might when we initially reviewed their candidacy. So, so what would you say are the most common re reasons that you hear students say, I'd like to take a gap year? Yeah, so sort of the, the top 10 list, I'm, I'm not sure I'll get to 10, <laughs> but to, top, top however many list. Uh, however many is, pop in your head extemporaneously. How many ever pop into my head is, is volunteering, home and away, uh, you know, uh, Outdoor education, no surprise being in Colorado, that that's an alignment sure. with, with what we do. And so, so many students are interested in outdoor adventure kinds of opportunities, whether formal or informal, uh, certainly travel, learning a language. Um, some students are interested in, especially in election years, working on campaigns, right? Something that is a very timely thing this fall, something that we would favor, right? So that's a form of volunteer work, I suppose. Uh, but yeah, lots of travel programs, lots of volunteering, uh, internships, uh, learning languages, gaining a particular skill that is not especially academic in nature necessarily, um, sort of fueling some of those passion projects. And, and we see students as they're putting together plans. We talk to students all through the phases of their sort of gap plan development from I had a spark of an idea to I've already laid out deposits for these specific programs. Um, we're, we're really working with them throughout that and really trying to hear where their curiosities lie and what motivates them that they're not running away from college, but running toward this experience that they couldn't necessarily accomplish while being full-time enrolled um, at, at our institution. So it's, you know, uh, a really fun process to be a part of, right? It's, it's a counseling conversation around what they might hope to uh, do during their time and figuring out whether they can accomplish that in a summer or in a summer and a fall or a summer and a fall and a spring. So uh, those are, are really fun conversations for me, at least, to be able to, to hear what students uh, are excited to do. The other two that come to mind that I've experienced on the counseling side, I don't know how common you see this. Um, one is I'd, I'd sort of call it like a special project. Like one of my best friends, I was helping his kid out uh, uh, just pro bono. And he really wanted to complete this filmmaking project. He'd started, didn't get a chance to finish. And so that I would sort of call that special project. That That's more of a one-off one. Mm -hmm. But when I see a decent amount is an athlete that wants to play a sport and they feel like an extra year of getting bigger, stronger would help them. Now, a lot of times this is in conjunction with doing a PG year at a, right. at a boarding school. I've seen it where they do it sort of in conjunction with the college, almost like the college has told them, hey, go here for a year and get better, stronger. And sometimes I've seen that with higher level athletics, like even like the Kentuckys right. in basketball, where they have like special relationships with coaches and go here under this, blah, blah, blah. And we'll sort of make an offer to you contingent on you doing this. I don't, do you ever see any of that kind of stuff or is that more higher D1 stuff, do you think? We, we do see that some. For the most part, students who are in a post-grad year are applying for admission during that PG. Correct. Um, but we are a school that carries two D1s. And That's true. Uh, you have hockey. And what's your other one? Women's soccer. That's right. Yep. So soccer, we were yeah. one of the inaugural yeah. members for, for women's soccer when that was created. Uh, we do see um, a decent number of students taking gap years, especially for our men's hockey team, where they will be applying right out of high school um, and then they'll play a year of juniors well you know on a gap year with us and then come in a year later um, so yeah you do we do see that some let's talk a little bit about how a student goes about requesting this gap year so and you could speak to cc as well as other perspectives you know that are out there so is this part of the application itself on the application 
Um, is it something where you go ahead and get admitted and then there's a special request after you're admitted? Uh, what, you know, what have you seen elsewhere and how do you do it at CC? Sure. And, and I would say like so many questions about the college search <laughs> when, when students have, it's not a unique path. I'm sure it feels unique, right? A gap experience is so personal. You're talking about that special project film. I'm sure that student felt like they were the first one to ever do that. Nobody else in their friend group is doing something similar. And and that can feel really isolating, a little bit scary. Uh, and that you might be a little bit shy about asking a college admission office, like, is, is this okay? Like, I'm secretly very excited to do right. this. Right. We want to have that conversation early and often. And so I would say for students who are interested in a gap year at whatever point in the search, it's okay. And and you should have that conversation, especially with those schools that a student is most keen on to say, what's your take? Like reach out to your territory rep, have a brief conversation to say, Hey, this is something I'm thinking about. Do you have any resources? Are you excited about gap years? I I would hope they're going to hear back some confirmation, some excitement that, hey, this is a student who's really curious and self-motivated. That should be a, a, a good fit for so many institutions and give some insight into how individual schools might approach that. In CC's case, we do ask on the application whether students are interested in pursuing an alternate start, whether gap semester or gap year. And on occasion, we will, there is an optional narrative built into that as well. We will hear students say, I am already committed to doing this gap experience. And that may cause us to offer them that gap offer straight away, right? So when we see that very strong interest in the application, that can impact our decision making right away so that they don't ever act officially have to ask for it, we might just make that offer um, in the first pass. In other cases, they may say, I'm exploring options. I'm considering these things. And that feels a little bit more ambiguous. We might still be excited about that, but we're more likely to make a traditional fall offer and then let that student make that request later on. Um, because we don't know whether the student is really committed to that. We want our good news to land as happily as possible. And we're not sure that Alt Start is really for sure in their path. Um, so for us, we actually do outreach in the spring to students for all students, regardless of what they said in the application, to raise awareness about gap options. So we're probably a little bit more aggressive than most other schools in saying, have you thought about this? Here are some resources. If you have questions, please reach out because that can begin the conversation, normalize that choice, um, and then get through the, uh, the request process. So for many institutions, that is a spring conversation after being admitted to submit that request. Um, but it it will vary institution by institution how late in the cycle they may be in a position to even say yes, right? We are all controlling our enrollments. And if we are right at our enrollment target, even the best of plans that is submitted in July might have to be a no because we really need to hit that enrollment target for the fall. And if there isn't a substantial buffer we might say, we really need that student to be here right now. In other cases, if our enrollment is sort of flush, uh, we might be really happy to entertain a July request and get us down to that enrollment target. So timing will vary school by school, and our ability to say yes may be dependent then on sort of where that we are in the enrollment cycle. And I know, Matt, Colorado College has the Gap Year Resource Consortium. Um, you, you've sort of been a, a leader. You've got way more resources um, on your, you know, 
website about gap years. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a history there? What, what, you know, how did you sort of take on kind of a leadership role in this field? Right. So I would say closer to 15 years ago, we had, I would say a still substantial gap population. I think that's a good cultural match with what CC does. Um, but that was probably 15, 20 gap years a year, still on the high side, maybe for, for schools like us. And we decided that we, with some of the research that we had done within the institution, and then yes, with the gap year research consortium and comparing data across institutions, that those students who come in after a gap year had some attributes that we really liked in our community. And so decided to be a bit more overt, a little bit more pushy uh, with gap years. It didn't take much to push uh, enrollment in gap years up um, by, by talking about it a little bit more. And what we've seen enrollment wise is, you know, a stronger uh, ability for students to come in with more direction, thinking in the liberal arts community where students have two years to declare a major, very large numbers of students are coming in undecided, which really means interested in lots of things. And students that came in via gap year were more likely to choose a major on time and have it stick. There was a much lower incidence of social infractions on the conduct discipline side of things. And so we really saw a reshaping of our community as we pushed toward more and more gap years. So we really liked that cultural shift there. Um, and, you know, seen across institutions, some of those similar impacts uh, of various uh, institution types from IVs to R1s. So it's not just a, a liberal arts community, but, but across a wide array. Yeah, and and Matt, I just want to get clarity again. So, because I can see some listener out there thinking, I wouldn't even know like where to start to find out sure. like what my options are. So, it sounds like you said you proactively tell all your admits about a gap year yes. option. So, I'm assuming assuming is, is that an email? Is that in in the portal? And and how from your experience, if somebody's you know, looking at other schools that are may not as proactive, like how do they even find out the, the options that the school provides? Right. Obviously, you know, Google is always my friend. Uh, and so, <laughs> you know, as uh, I don't know uh, that you know this even, uh, but maybe this is a good time to reveal that I'm also the dad of a high school senior. I was going to wonder if you'd bring that up. <laughs> who is navigating the college search uh he's he's made his choice of of where he's gonna go but he has not actually decided when he's gonna go yet so we are as a family in the midst of this conversation actively as well so we've been googling um and you know in, in looking for programs the american gap association is a mm -hmm. huge resource obviously students can go to our uh, if, you know, if they're looking at Colorado College and Gap, that our page is going to come up. I think we've got some good resources, though certainly not exhaustive, because we post listings that our students have participated in and have given us very strongly positive feedback. So that's not every opportunity, and so many of our Gap students are designing their own program. Um, and, you know, being a ski resort lift up for a few months and learning how to surf in Costa Rica for a few months and woofing for a few weeks. And they're, they're doing so many different uh, informal or less formal opportunities than something like the American Gap Association is going to list. But I think those are starting points for, get, for, for families to engage in, like what captivates your attention Wow, there's a huge range of budgets, of styles, of homestays, and all of that. Like, what really suits that family's needs, whether budget or timing or formality, health and safety, those are all going to be different uh, for different students and families. So that's sort of how we started this process is sort of looking through a big list and saying, oh, no, that doesn't really apply to us. Uh, I, I would say the the other thing, surprisingly is on Reddit and Discord um, and is 
hearing from students who have done or are doing those experiences and hearing what their joys and challenges have been and and hearing that in the conversation as well. I think that that student to student conversation has been really powerful um, to sort of understand, okay, what is my appetite for risk and self-design versus having something packaged that I've got to apply for? So those are all things that we've taken advantage of. Friends, this concludes the first part of my interview with Matt Bonser, talking about frequently asked questions about the gap year. We hope you'll join us next week for part two of three. And remember, you can always listen to the full interview at your collegeboundkid.com under the interview tab. And now it's time for a question from one of our listeners. All right. So, Susan, we have a, a, a detailed question. And I appreciate Jane from Connecticut sending this in because I definitely know it's the first time we've had this question. And we'll play it and get your thoughts about her student who's a classical pianist. Hi, my name is Jane and I'm from Connecticut and I've been an avid listener of your podcast and really appreciate you guys so much as I'm about to embark on the college process with my oldest child. I have a high school junior and my student is an accomplished musician who has studied classical piano since he was very young. And I'm wondering the best way to showcase his talent in the activity section of the college application. Unfortunately, the nature of classical piano is that there aren't as many tangible metrics or awards that one can point to, such as being concert master of their orchestra or making all state band or chorus. He studies piano privately and participates in three to four recitals a year, among other public performances at church and in the community. He is planning to submit an art supplement, and maybe that's the best option, but I'm wondering how that is read in context with the activity section. If helpful, he's likely planning to apply to highly selective liberal arts colleges, NESCAC and others, as a math or science major, and might also consider a minor in music. Thanks so much for your help. Jane, what a great question, and how proud you must be of your son to be an accomplished pianist. It's uh, such a spectacular enterprise for a young person to reach a high level of of music study. And, And I know piano is... Classical piano is a lot of theory. It's a lot of um, understanding other instruments, and you even learn some conducting, I know, as you go through your piano studies. But anyway, that said, sounds like he's not going to be a music major, might be a minor, which is great at a liberal arts college because, you know, no doors are shut to students um, at liberal arts colleges. Um, you know, even schools like like Oberlin and Rochester and and others that have conservatories or professional schools of music under their roof, under their umbrella, Um, talented students in the arts and sciences can cross over and study at a high level if they um, are interested in in being in a conservatory level. Now, some of those double degree programs, um, you have to be admitted, the student has to be admitted to both the College of Arts and Sciences and the conservatory simultaneously, but there, there is, I know I read, I read applications uh, for a few years for a university that did have a music conservatory, kind of a standalone music conservatory. It wasn't just like an academic department. Um, and it was uh, a very famous one. And there was a dual degree program where the student would apply through admissions. And then they would also have their, their music supplement and which included an audition In that case, that gave the, we love those students. They got quite a bit of a competitive edge in the arts and sciences because we felt that that was something that was very special. It was a value of the university to embrace those kids who were high level musicians and um, getting their degrees in, you know, whatever, business, engineering, French. (laughs) So that's one kind of way to look at it with certain kinds of schools that may be true at other schools that also, I don't want to give names because I'm, sure. I'm not as familiar with them. You know, in terms of liberal arts colleges, when, when I worked at Bates College, which was a very traditional liberal arts college, the music degree that was given was a BA. 
It was not a Bachelor of Music. So it was a liberal arts music degree. So all of the ensembles and everything musical was liberal arts kids and music majors. There were actually very few music majors. <laughs> um, so we were keen on recruiting students who clearly were going to make a contribution to the life of the community through their music while they majored in something else. So we did have music supplements, and this is something that you and your son will probably need to look into, but in for a non-music major, you might want to find out who listens to the music supplements. Because in my experience, we sent them to the music department and they rated them. Is that how most people do it, Susan? Some colleges, if you're not applying as a music major. Yeah, that's true. It, they don't go to the department. Yeah, I wasn't thinking about that. They, there might be somebody on the admission staff who does that work, which is fine also. I mean, that's a fine way, you know, to do it. And now here's a third variety. There are there are colleges that have liberal arts music degree programs, but they do offer m music merit scholarships for non-majors. And that I feel can be a wonderful opportunity for someone like Jane's son, who's a high-level pianist, um, could very well be involved in chamber music, in orchestral work, accompanist of ensembles. You know, there are lots of ways that pianists contribute as well as their own, their own recitals. Um, but there are some schools that simply want more numbers in their music program, and they may, may be willing to put some, some money on the table. What are your thoughts on how much of a thumb on the scale this is? Like, I felt that was implied in the question. Going to be applying to some highly competitive schools, yep. NESCAC and others. I felt one of the implications, besides just how do you recommend going about it, is, is it make a difference in the admission process? And if so, how much? So what are your thoughts on that? Well, that's that's hitting the nail on the head, Mark. Um, it make it can make a significant difference for an underrepresented instrument. You know, your your slogan is colleges want more of what they don't have enough of, right? Mm -hmm. It's true of everything. Sure, sure. <laughs> it could be the philosophy major. It sure. could be the um, uh, the pole. I don't. I was going to say polo, but that's a little far fetched. Sure. But, you know, sure. a sport that isn't as you know popular. So in music. Uh, there are simply instruments that are are tend to be underrepresented. Now that can vary a little bit from year to year, mm -hmm. but you know, liberal arts colleges, universities always have plenty of violinists and and flautists and whatever else. You know, they're just instruments that a lot of kids play, and that's a good thing because then a lot of kids get to participate, right? But, you know, if you come along with a bassoon or a harp mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or even a high-end oboe. Mm -hmm. Even French horn a little, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. French horn took mm -hmm. the words right out of my mouth. Yeah. Then a student will um, will get, a, a, as you say, a thumb on the scale. Now, where mm -hmm. does that leave our pianists, mm -hmm. right? I think there's some very different kinds of pianists. And this may be what Jane and her son want to explore is, you know, uh, presenting a portfolio of solo, solitary work is probably not going to be all that a college would value. What they're going to look for in, in a pianist, and this is probably a conversation they should have with some of the colleges, but what they're going to look for is the potential contribution that that student is going to make to that community. You know, is this a student who's going to play um, the piano at chapel services? Um, are they going to be in a jazz ensemble with a whole bunch of kids? Um, are they going to accompany the, um, the chorus? Are they going to step into rehearsal accompanist roles? You know, where... 
where is their background? And then how do they see plugging into the music community at that liberal arts college? And, you know, there I was at Bates, one of those NESCAC schools. And those kids, the value added based on the potential contribution of the student was was significant. And that would go along with whatever the rating was. So the music department would listen to um, the submissions and give us a, a rating, two ratings. One was a skill rating. So was this a one rated, I don't even remember what the scale was, a one rated instrumental player, meaning the best of the the year, or a five, which would be barely a contributor, but could still be involved maybe, but don't give them you know, a bump up. The second rating was How badly did they want the students? And this was exactly the same as the athletic coaches, by the way. Sure, sure. Uh, The music department and the theater department and dance departments followed the athletic model exactly to try and get some of the kids that they wanted. Let me say something, Susan, because it just hit me that the term NESCAC for some might be inside baseball because the... Uh, you know, it was in the question and we've thrown it around. It's just an acronym for the New England Small College Athletic Conference. So that's so a group of small colleges as big as Tufts, but most of them tend to be the 2000 under 3000 person schools. So it's Williams and Amherst and Middlebury and and Bates and Colby and Bowdoin and what, Connecticut Wesleyan. College, Hamilton. Yep. Connecticut. Wesleyan. So, yep. So it's that that's what NESCAC refers to. Yeah, they're very academic. Correct. They're very academic, traditional liberal arts colleges with strong residential, you know, campus life. Yeah. Um, so I just really I just thought about that. Somebody might not have known that term. So yeah. Yeah. No, they and and Jane, I'm excited your son is looking at those schools because I don't think you can get your money's worth out of any institution as well as you can at a a liberal arts college. And I, you know, I'm all for research universities too, but um, I was, I was spoiled by attending a liberal arts college, um, especially someone who has myriad academic interests and personal interests that they want to explore and be part of a community. So Susan, I, I know you've great. touched on this, but do you feel there's an extra thumb on the scale? If Jane would have said, my student wants to pursue major in in pursue music and major in music as opposed to they like it a lot and they might they may minor in it do you feel that's a factor at all on how much of a thumb on the scale it is or do you think it's just strictly how good are you graded out when we assess your talent well liberal arts colleges generally don't believe kids anyway when they put down their academic interests mark i mean it, truthfully that's why when you read the phrasing on the Common App Supplement for any of these small liberal arts colleges, they're not saying what's your first choice major and what's your second choice major. That's much more traditional of bigger universities where you're admitted directly to an undergraduate school or college, and even you're kind of getting in line for particular majors. And you're very much assessed in the application process as preparation and fit for that academic program. Uh, liberal arts colleges are almost the the opposite. Now, things have become a little more specialized over the years, um, but liberal arts colleges are a smorgasbord. You know, they're a buffet table of choices, and that's why they exist. They're there for students to study broadly, um, find kind of find their intellectual muse. And not to not to kind of professionalize their undergraduate education in the same way. That's not to say that they don't send pl- plenty of kids to medical school and sure. on for advanced degrees in business and you know scholarly fields. Of course they do. But- I, I should have worded that differently. I, what I was really trying to ask was. Do you think so? Going back to your statement you made before, which I would completely agree with, some of the value of the thumb on the scale is that you will get involved and you will be the person that will 
use your talents to elevate and strengthen our community. Is that undermined at all if you're not seen as somebody who's pursuing that? And you know, Because that's an extrapolation. Nobody knows for sure where you're actually going to get involved, right? You're just making extrapolations. Oh, this person really cares deeply about this. I can see them contributing here, you know? And so if you have two people and one's a music major, they're, they're saying they want to pursue that. Do you see that factoring in at all to the perception of where someone will contribute? Or do you think there's enough other things? Look, they did that in their past school. They've done these kinds of, I've seen other areas where they've contributed when I look at that and it's a complete non-factor. I don't know if that was clear or or not clear with that. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't think that putting music as your first choice academic mm-hmm. destination is a factor here. I think- Okay, in then fact, you answered it. That's good. You know, kids who apply for undergraduate music, as I said earlier, Mark, there's the professional degree and then there's the liberal arts degree. The kids that are interested in majoring in a music at a liberal arts college and getting a BA tend to be um, musicologists, um, like ethnomusicologists. They're looking at that combination of music history where music and anthropology intersect. they It's not a performance major at a liberal arts college if it's a BA. The performance majors are the Bachelor of Music degree. And they could be at a college, but a college that has a professional music program, which is not every every. That's an important arts distinction. That's an important distinction. I think it is. Yeah. I think it is. And it would be a certain kind of student who would want to go study music at a liberal arts college, they would probably be on more of a scholarly path or headed toward music education. So then just one last thing. So we were talking before about more rare instruments <laughs> and, you know, you never actually said how classical piano tends to land in places. And I know that can completely vary from school to school. We have to say that unless you're in that admission office. You really don't know the needs of that institution and who they may have and who they may be losing. But it, I'm not trying to be negative, but I'm trying to have some straight talk. Would it be fair to say that classical pianist is not necessarily an instrument that that's considered a, a rare find? I just don't want to have that be the paradigm. I think sure. colleges, especially liberal arts colleges, Mark, as you know, really respect kids for dedication Uh and sticking with something. Classical piano is a great example because it takes a lot of time. Uh Um, You know, there's the character that is built around being, being a classical pianist or really a high level classical musician. And that care, that character is greatly admired because it speaks to discipline, it, it it speaks to brain training, to deep respect for teachers, and you know you you know what I'm getting at is so sure. whether or not that student would ever it's like play their sport <laughs> or contribute through their music is one thing, but I really want Jane to understand that that colleges are going to respect the level of dedication. What colleges, however, always look for in the application is what's in it for us. Sure. And that's the piece I'm trying to suss out. Like, Yeah. Where's the payoff going to be? What's their assessment of what's in it for them Right. in a situation like this? I mean, one could could be, you're extraordinarily good when we grade you out. And there's places right away where we could take advantage of that talent level. You know, um, certainly there's the personal quality of what you said about dedication, but certainly that pertains to lots of different things, you know, right? Um, And once again, these things are really hard for us to speak of in a vacuum because it could land differently into different admission offices. And I think it's really important that we say that. Yeah, but it is always going to come down to the potential contribution of the student, unless it's a conservatory program. Correct. I that mean, it's a BA, no matter what subjects it's in, they're looking for contributors to campus life because 
they've got a lot of great, well-qualified applicants. I think we should end on that, Susan. I think it's important for Jane's student to know that to the extent to which this is valid, I mean, it'll, it will be respected, but to the extent to which it can land in a way where, for lack of a better word, it's more of a thumb on the scale than it may or may not be, will be to the extent to which the admission officers perceive that this is a gift that could come help our school. Right. And so it may be behooves, in my opinion, it behooves Jane's student to have other ways in the application where they communicate how they would like to use their gifts and talents and not just yep. and not just leave it out there that this is something I did. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I and I suggest they talk to not just an admissions person with this question, but to someone in the music department. You That's know, great, look on you great, can look on the website point. at the music department. You can find out who who's in charge of the instrumental program, who's in charge of the ensemble program. You know, part of what Jane's son is going to want to do is continue to study, I guess, with a high level person. But I think there's a conversation to be had there. Thank you, Jane. Thank you. Thanks for sending that great question. Thank you and best wishes. And now this week's interview with a special guest. Friends, in part one of my interview with Scholar Match, Hannah and Nora introduced themselves and they explained what Scholar Match is. Nora explains how many students and counselors are part of Scholar Match. Hannah and Nora explain why they joined Scholar Match. Hannah and Nora explain what a day in the life of a college coach looks like. They answer the question, what type of experience is needed to be a college coach with Scholar Match? And what type of education does a coach need to meet the Scholar Match qualifications? Hannah and Nora explain the training modules and the Scholar Match counselors are expected to go through and what is involved in the training. Nora gives some of the history of where Scholar Match started and where the headquarters is located. Nora gives the profile of who a Scholar Match student is, and she defines what they mean by low income. Nora explains what is involved in the application a student has to complete to become a Scholar Match scholar. And finally, Nora talks about how they match students with counselors. Listen and enjoy. Friends, you're in for a special interview. It's a type of interview we've never done before. I'm here today with two fine young ladies from Scholar Match in California. Are you both in California? Yes. Yes, I'm in San Francisco. Great, great, great. So I'm here with Hannah Takasuka and Nora Rosales. And they are two Scholar Match counselors. And so why don't we start by just letting you share a little bit about your background. Well, hi, my name is Nora Rosales. I have been a college and career coach with Scholar Match for a little over two years. Um, I am a first-gen student myself, which is why I decided to work with Scholar Match, and I've really enjoyed my time here. And Hannah? Yeah, hi, my name is Hannah Takasuka. Um, I'm a person of contrast, so I actually have rich parents, but they sent me to a school with predominantly Latina students who are low-income. Um, and that's what inspired me to start in the college access world. Um, I'm currently a bioinformatics scientist. Awesome. And I'm just going to share a little bit about how this interview came to be. So uh, just by way of background, one of our co-hosts, uh, Dr. Lisa Ruff, has been a Scholar Match College coach for some time and holds the program in very high regard. And our regular listeners, if it sounds familiar, she did an interview with Bryn from Wyoming uh, on our podcast about a year and a half ago. And so unbeknownst to us, some people at Scholar Match um, are listeners to our podcast, and they recognize that this could be a really good opportunity to identify um, additional college coaches, college counselors, because they need a sizable number of college counselors to serve all their students. And so uh, they reached out to me about it. And I thought it was a great idea because um, so many people who listen and interact with me say, I want to be a college counselor. That sounds so much fun. Or they'll say, you know what? My kid 
is gone and they're in college, but I still keep listening because I just find this stuff fascinating. And so I really felt like our listenership is, for lack of a better words, a great place for them to go fishing to find additional college counselors. You know, I, I, I really do. Does either one of you want to share a little bit about like um, the program and what Scholar Match does? Let's just start with the basics. You know, what is Scholar Match? Uh, so Scholar Match is a nonprofit organization. We offer free personalized college admissions counseling to our underserved first generation students uh, from low income backgrounds. Our college coaches support around one to three students each. Uh, they guide them through various aspects of the college application process that includes navigating financial aid, building college lists, working on personal essays, and anything that comes up with these students, the coaches are there to help them. About how many counselors are part of Scholar Match and about how many students do you serve? Right now, we're about at 300 to 400 coaches. Uh, I believe right now we might have like a, around 1,200 students. Um, and this year we're trying to really amp up the numbers with our students and coaches. Therefore, you know, that's why we are looking to recruit more coaches for that need. I know you wouldn't be at Scholar Match in a volunteer uh, role if you didn't find it fulfilling. So uh, why don't we start with Hannah for this one and then feel free to chime in, Nora. What drew you to Scholar Match? Sure. Um, I was a part of Matriculate, which was another College Point um, nonprofit, um, similarly works on college access to underserved students. I was interested in Matriculate and college access in the first place because I went to a high school with predominantly Latina students who are low income. I saw the inequities that existed between me and my classmates, and there were certain pain points, such as having only one counselor to 400 students per class that I knew that we weren't getting the resources that we deserved. And so I wanted to be able to uh, bridge the gap between those resources by being a college coach. Anything you want to add to that, Nora? Yeah, for me, it was my own journey and experience of being a first-gen student. I firsthand felt like I didn't get the support that I would have liked. Uh, and that's what kind of encouraged me to become a counselor. I'm actually in grad school right now to become a counselor. Uh, so it was that need that I saw for counselors that help these first gen students, which is also why I decided to come to Scholar Match to get that experience. Because I, I was younger and I felt like people didn't really take me serious because I didn't have that experience of, of counseling. So Scholar Match offered that opportunity to me to be able to help and give back to the students that are just like me. So it's very amazing to see the work that comes out of this. All the coaches are very passionate about what they do since I'm on the back end as well of seeing, because we do get our coaches to submit coach reports to see the progress that these uh, students make and the coaches make uh, with each other. So I see all of these experiences and wonderful things that come out of that relationship between the coach and the student it's and a lot of our students are getting into amazing colleges our, our coaches are passionate they always email us about if they don't if they have questions they reach out to us and you know they are more than willing to go the extra mile to support these students so it's really amazing to get to see the impact that scholar match is having on these first gen students love your enthusiasm uh, let's talk about a day in the life of a scholar match coach. Like, what does that look like? It's a fairly vultural program, which is great, has been great for me throughout college and after college. Um, if I'm traveling, I just know that I can always communicate with my students via Zoom and text, and that's the default. Um, Sometimes coaches will go and visit students for major milestones in person, such as graduating high school or college, uh, but primarily the communication is over video call and text and shared documents. So it sounds like meeting a student in person is an option, but not expected or doesn't normally happen. Is that fair to say? Mm -hmm. I mentored students in different states and time zones as well. Awesome. So let's talk a little bit about the experience 
that's required for volunteers? Do they um, do they need to have a lot of experience, no experience? Do you train them? Talk to me a little bit about that. What does that look like? So uh, to become a college coach, you don't need any experience. Uh, we train our volunteers. If they don't have any experience in college counseling, we do have training and we have the onboarding process before they're matched with students. Um, if, and if you do have experience, if you come from being a school counselor or if you're an IEC, um, you can submit a waiver to get those trainings waived. Uh, but we offer that training. We have our onboarding modules. That's what we call them. Uh, we offer how to build a balanced college list. So many different things are incorporated into those modules. And of course, if our coaches do have questions along the way, we're there to support them. Uh, for Scholar Match, it's required to have a bachelor's degree. If there's anyone on this channel who's looking uh, to be a college coach, um, but is hasn't finished their bachelor's degree, is currently a college student that matriculates a great organization that does similar work. Let's take a break to learn about Mark's recommended resource for the week. For our recommended resource, I want to amplify something that was said in both of our interviews today. Matt said something you may have missed, and I want to underscore it. The American Gap Association is a great resource for finding out more about gap years and for getting even more answers to your questions about gap years. And the Gap Year Association is our recommended resource for episode 407. We will now return to my interview with Nora and Hannah about Scholar Match and the great work they do and the unique opportunity you have to partner with them by having one to three students you help with the college process. Even if you do not have any experience, they will train you. And let's talk a little bit more about the modules because that's fascinating to me. So what are the different modules and like, how long does it take to kind of go through the training process for the different modules? I was able to flip through it pretty quickly because I w had volunteered with Matriculate before. Um, but there are certain standards that have been accepted in the college access community on how to build a balanced college list. And so you want a mixture of safety schools or schools that you have a high chances of getting accepted to as well as those that are reach schools, those that might have lower acceptance rates, but possibly better resources or um, yeah, better resources for your major socially or being a first gen student or otherwise. Yeah, so we offer uh, like activities. Uh, we, we give like slides, presentations throughout those modules and our coaches, we assign them some activities at the end of those modules just to see if they understood what was taught in, in, those, act in those sections. Um, and we're actually, like I mentioned, since I'm working also on the back end, we're, we always update the modules, make sure that they're up to date with whatever is going on in the college admission sphere. Uh, so we make sure to update those. But yeah, more than anything, we have those activities that help sum up and see if our coaches understood what was taught in those modules. And at the end, of course, we ask for if we, they have any feedback for us in those modules. Um, that way, we also are up to date or see if there's any suggestions and how we could amp those up for the following year. So when you go over how to build a college list, are you also providing resources, um, whether it's websites or access to software, like what, what's, uh, what tools um, are included um, be besides just sort of telling people the importance of having a balanced list? I generally recommend the college board, college search. I forget exactly what the term is. Um, Bigfuture.org? Big Future? Big Future, Big Future, yes. Big Future, because you can provide, you can add different filters. Say you want a college that's in a particular state or that provides a particular major or that's a particular size. I also emphasize picking colleges that are mostly high financial aid need met, which means that if a student has a particular finan large financial need that they're meeting most of what uh, them and their family can't afford. Um, Scholar Match also has a search tool that specifically is for first gen low income students, I believe, maybe Nora could um, correct me on that, but that is a little bit of a stronger filter 
um, than College Board might provide if a student is feeling a bit overwhelmed with all of the options that College Board Big Future is listing for them. What do you want to add to that, Nora? Yeah, we offer our coaches a plethora of resources. Uh, something that I really loved having, and as a coach, when I, I first gained access to this, this was very helpful. We have a toolkit that we offer our coaches, and you could find anything from resources for undocumented students to building um, uh, the lists. We offer all those resources within our documents to so our coaches could look for these uh, lists that they could build. So they uh, We offer... Also, on top of that, our Scholar Matcher, I think that's the one that you were talking about, <clears throat> Hannah, the Scholar Matcher tool that helps find those colleges that students are the best fit for. We ask our coaches to build that balance list with eight different colleges from Reach, Match, and Safety. I believe those are the three. Um, so, yeah, we offer all those resources. And like I mentioned, we have like our own uh email that we share with our coaches. That way, if they're in the process and have questions, they could reach out to us. So a couple other areas that strike me as important. One would be anything related to tips towards strengthening your application, right? That could be anything from helping with essays to reviewing activities lists to talking about conversations around things like early decision and early action and you know, whether to apply test optional. I mean, there's, the list goes on and on, right? Strategies to sort of increase your chances of getting in. Um, another another area would be everything related to sort of financial counseling and um, assessing affordability um, and, and things of that nature. Do the modules cover any of those type of things as well? Yes, the modules uh, cover things like that. And um, something in addition to everything that you said stuck that I find to be helpful is helping students break down the documentation that exists on these websites. So, for example, explaining to students what being binding under QuestBridge means and whether that's a good fit or not for them. I find that if you don't introduce students to those ideas, a lot of times they're um, going to be too overwhelmed or get confused on their own and not be applying to those opportunities. Now, I know you're California-based, Scholar Match. Are you in the Bay Area? Located out of the Bay Area as in terms of headquarters? Uh, well, we that's our physical location. We don't, uh, you know, we're not there physically. Uh, but yeah, we're located, well, we started in San Francisco and now we've also, another one of our Headquarters was in LA, uh, but we don't have that physical location anymore. We, but primarily, we started out in those LA and San Francisco regions. So, are you looking for counselors primarily from California, or does it not really matter, you know, where the counselors are located? There's a high need for volunteers in California, but we recruit volunteers from all over the country. So, it doesn't matter if our coaches are out of the state. We would love to have more California coaches, as I said, but it definitely it's open to everyone. And what about the the applicants for Scholar Match? Like, talk to us a little bit about that process. Like, you know, what are you looking for when you admit a student into your program? Well, I'll just ask it open endedly. I I'll probably have some follow ups based on how you answer that. So we primarily look for students that are low income, first generation. That's like the majority or the main requirement from our students that they are low income and first generation. We ask several other questions in the application, like the GPA. So the requirement that we have for students outside of California, the requirement for the GPA is a 3.5 or higher. Uh, we also have some income eligibility guidelines that we share on our website, and that, that's something that I could share with you. That way, you know, if any students are interested in applying to the program, they could review those guidelines. And then for our San Francisco students, the GPA requirement is a 2.0 or higher. Um, and we also have those guidelines on the website as well. So that's something that I could share uh, for, with you so our, the audience could take a look at that as well. Is the 2.0 in San Francisco, because there's a big difference between 2.0 and 3.5, do you, does that just sort of reflect the historic roots? You're sort of founded there and sort of a special commitment to 
to the local region? Is that why you're willing to dip so much lower, do you think? Or is there a lot of students do community college or any thoughts on that? Yeah, so I'm not so involved with the logistics of uh, um, how they decide the GPA requirements, but I know that's also a reason why, um, since we're primarily San Francisco based, and I know there might be some donors who also set kind of their own guidelines of the kind of students they would want to serve. Um, that's why that GPA might be a bit lower as opposed to students outside of California. Uh, all of us get donors. I used to do fundraising work for a school. So yeah, you have a donor that says, I want to support kids who are, you know, two to three point GPO, then that go find them and recruit them. And just yeah. one more clarification. So is it three, five for the rest of California and the two O is just the Bay area or is that is the two O all of California? And three five is other states. Uh, so the application that we have right now is primarily focused in the Bay Area, and the requirements that we have for that is that students have that two point GPA or above. Okay, for the Bay Area. All right, thanks. All right, does that help out? Definitely. Okay, and how how are you defining low income? Low income. I believe the guideline is le- eighty thousand or less per the household income. And is there any test score requirement at all? No, no test score requirement. Is there in the application process, does like the student need to get like a letter recommendation or anything like that? Or is it just submit your transcript and submit your or submit your um financial, you know, tax form or, or, or is there like an essay or something to say why you want to be a part of the program? Like what's involved in the application? Uh, they do have to fill out all that personal information. Like, like I mentioned, the GPA, there's no essay requirement. Uh, I think there's like a short section where they just put like a little bit of information about themselves. We ask the preferences that they have to get matched with the coach. Um, more than anything, it's for us to get all that data to effectively match them with a coach we have like their preferences section um that that of course that gpa portion and the financial income is what determines more than anything if they'll be admitted into the program but we do that more than anything just to make sure that it's those under-resourced students that we are helping talk to me a little bit more about the preferences you mentioned preferences like what are you looking for in there when it comes to matching So when we match them, we want to make sure that they align with the coach, what their expertise is. Let's say we have a student who wants to go into the STEM field. That's a question that we ask in the application, what major they're interested in. Um, And we make sure that we do match the student in accordance to what the expertise is that the coach has told us that they have. And for example, we also have students who are primarily Spanish speaking. Like this year, I got a student who just primarily spoke Spanish and that was one of the requests in the application. So we made sure to accommodate that he was matched with me because I I speak Spanish. So it just, we want to make sure that that relationship, they're able to build rapport with each other because that's important. We want to make sure that, you know, they're understanding each other. And also if for some reason the match doesn't work out, let's say maybe the student, you know, doesn't want to move forward with this coach or the coach, you know, we, they reach out to us and we make sure that we try to accommodate them the best that we can. Great. Great. Friends, this concludes the first part of my interview with Nora and Hannah about Scholar Match. Hope you join us next week for part two of three. And now it's time for our college spotlight of the week. Friends, if you missed part one of my interview with Gil Villanueva on Rhodes College, do yourself a favor and go back and check out part one. But in part two, the final part of my interview with Gil Villanueva, Gil answers the question, is there any tension when you're talking about diversity, equity, belonging, and inclusion when you're located in a ruby red state? How does the honor code impact the student experience at Rhodes? And I ask Gil, what does he hear from students? What do they regard as the best departments at Rhodes? I ask Gil if crime is a problem at Rhodes. And I ask Gil if a student needs to be involved in Greek life to feel at home at Rhodes College. Listen and enjoy. So here's a question. I know when you were at 
at Harvey Mudd. I mean, California is fairly progressive state. Brandeis, fairly progressive state. You know, Richmond is, you know, purplish, but leaning more blue. Uh, when people think of Tennessee, they think of a pretty ruby red state. And so when you're talking social justice and DEI and um, is there tension between roads and, and sort of the, the culture of the surrounding area? And if, so, and if so, how do you navigate that? Well, what a, what a great question. Uh, Memphis is a deep blue. It, it is very much a, a very blue city uh, in, in, a, in a red state. Um, so I can tell you that uh, we, we fit perfectly here in Memphis. Uh, so it's a, it's a good thing. It's a wonderful marriage. There's symbiotic relationships left and right. Uh, so it really helps quite a bit. Um, not to say that we don't value other positions and other ideas. It just means that where we're located, it's something that I feel like our students understand there's an opportunity here for them, uh, at least definitely to, to, to make that kind of impact. And Memphis, you know, understands that Rhodes provides, you know, uh, an added uh, dynamic to the city. Uh, we don't have very many colleges and universities here in Memphis. Um, and I wish we had more, but I can tell you our students are pretty spoiled in a way because, you know, they don't have to stand in line, so to speak, to get that job or that internship just because they don't have to compete with as many. So Memphis benefits from that. We have faculty here who belong in, in different organizations um, in the city. And so I feel like, you know, we want to belong here and we want to be part of the city in, in every way. Uh, so with that in mind, you know, we, again, that, that piece about giving back is a big deal here. You know, my brother's always telling me it's the sort of this red blue paradigm is not actually accurate. And it's actually more cities and suburbs versus exurbs and rural communities. And it and it's actually true. When you look at it throughout the South, you know, in urban centers and suburban centers, they tend to be more more blue. Even even Tuscaloosa, Alabama and Auburn, Auburn, Alabama the voting patterns were more on the progressive side. So I think sometimes there's a stereotype of red states or vice versa, blue states. And it's, I think your point is well taken. And I'm here in Atlanta, which is, which is, you know, quite uh, progressive, but then you could go to an hour away and Marjorie Taylor Greene, you know, so very different. So yeah, your point is well taken. You know, you're, you're right there in Memphis. So I think that's important to, to hear that because one thing I often hear from people is a stereotype of either blue states or red states by the whole entire state and people not looking at kind of the local area around where they are and sort of seeing if it fits in for the, how they are culturally. Oh, yeah. What I like about where we're located is, you know, again, we're, we're situated in a progressive city and yet, you know, within a 30 minute drive, you know, you could be in a different sort of you know, political environment, and that's okay. And, and so that's how we learn, right? Because sure. if all of a sudden we're just speaking to ourselves and having that kind of conversation and with no one else, how do we truly grow? How do we truly learn, right? Yeah, I'm always saying to students, these colleges do not want to be homogenous echo chambers. So that's a uh, point well taken. So let's talk about your honor code, because I know you have an honor code. How does the honor code impact the student experience, would you say, Ed Rhodes, Gil? Sure. Uh, Rose is one of the first schools to have this, this type of honor code. Our students are, are introduced to it as early on uh, as, in fact, during, uh, throughout our, our, in our website, it's, it's in our publications. And certainly when they get to campus, you know, they actually have to sign uh, their names on a, a big board along with their classmates that they truly understand and embrace the honor code here. At, at Rhodes College. So it's a big deal for us. Uh, it means that, you know, you will unknowingly not want to hurt anyone. You're not going to hurt yourself. You're in a position to support one another. You're going to, you know, be an honorable member of this community. So th that's something I think that permeates the whole place. It's not just with students, but faculty and staff also uh, embrace that, that sort of outlook that, you know, we want to conduct ourselves in such a way that 
everyone is going to feel comfortable and safe on campus and welcomed, of course, because as I mentioned, you know, it's not just DEI, but belonging also. Sure, sure. So, Gil, let's say I were to camp out on campus and and interview 200 students, and I just went around talking to student after student, and I asked them, what do you think is the strongest department um, at Rhodes? Uh, what, what do you think the students would say based on uh, your interaction with them? Well, I hope faculty will forgive me because they're all good. They're I all know. Terrific. That's why I they're worded it great. so you could just be telling oh, me what you hear from yeah. students. <laughs> I know, I know, but even there, but I can tell you the, the most populated majors on campus, you know, tends to be biology, business, psychology, English, history, uh, international uh, uh, studies is a big deal for us as well. Uh, we have students that are interested in economics, we have students that are keen on the, the arts. I don't know if you know this, but um, we don't have a music business school here at Rhodes, and yet Billboard magazine rates Rhodes as having one of the top music business schools in the United States. In fact, you know, two consecutive years, and I think three out of the last four years, because we have the Curb Institute, and the Curb Institute takes our students and have them learn all the different facets, aspects of, of you know, the music business. And it's not just production, but the back end as well, and connecting them, connecting them with various uh, studios here in Memphis. I don't know for for our listeners out there, you know, this is the birthplace of rock and roll and home of the blues, and sure. music is huge, huge here in Memphis. And there's concerts, you know, all the time, indoor, outdoor. And, and if you're here in the warmer months, there are going to be big outdoor concerts here. Uh, and, and some of them are actually on the, by the river. So uh, it, it's a fun place to be. Uh, I can tell you political science. I, I hope I didn't forget to say that, um, uh, you know, just because that's a big uh, major for us. And in fact, um, we have one of the top mock trial teams in the United States for a school of our size. We do really, really well. In fact, we hosted the national championships last uh, spring here, here in Memphis. I love how you did that. Not letting Nashville claim all that music uh, love there, because I know they're always uh, talking about Music Row, and they and they do have some great schools for music there as well. Oh, but but you they can have hold country your own. music. They have country music. You know, we have soul. We have the blues. We have <laughs> there rock you go. and roll. There you go. There's enough room in Tennessee to spread it around. <laughs> hey, you know. Uh, uh, talk to me about your sort of medical pathway program, because I know you have a really strong program there, and I'll oftentimes refer you for for people that are on that sort of doctor path. That is a, a big program for us. Uh, I can tell you that uh, our students do very, very well, uh, regardless if they major in STEM or not. STEM is, is a big you know, pursuit for many of our students. And I can tell you that our success rate in terms of admission to med school is really, really high. For those students that sought uh, guidance from our pre-health advisors and you know they, they have taken um, the right courses and they've earned you know a decent GPA, let's call that 3.5 or 3.6 or higher, and those, those students have an 81% chance and 81% acceptance rate to med school, which is a lot, lot higher than your average of, you know, not even 40%. So our students do very well with that. I think what helps is the fact that when our faculty are looking to conduct research, it's going to be with you because we don't have many grad students here, right? So you're going to be in a position to do high level research to co-publish with faculty. And if you're interested in conducting your own research, by all means, we want to support you with that. Research sometimes is the unwritten requirement for med schools. And that's something our students are able to do, not just here on campus, but through the city of Memphis. Um, you know, we have St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, which is one of the largest, biggest children's research hospitals in the United States. And we have a good number of connections there, including alumni that work at St. Jude's. And, uh, and even the surrounding hospitals where our students are able to pursue internships and, and even do research over the summertime. 
at St. Jude's in the nearby hospital. So that really helps in my opinion. Uh, so to me, you know, in fact, one thing we talk about, we brag about all the time, you know, vet school is actually harder to get into than med school. And yet our vet school acceptance rate is actually over 90%. The national wow. acceptance rate is 27%. And wow. it really helps when the Memphis Zoo is across the street. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean, talking about an opportunity where you, know, you can do this, this high-level research with not just small animals, but with big animals. This is awesome. This is awesome. And um, but I can't have a total love fest. I have a little Tim Russert in me. So I have to <laughs> I have to ask a couple non softball questions. So please, I want to share a couple stereotypes I hear and I want you to comment on one is Rhodes is great, but it's in Memphis. And that's a that's a very dangerous city. And safety is really important to me. And I'm not sure if my, I'm comfortable with my student going to such a dangerous city. What would you say about that? So the, the campus itself, Rhodes College and the surrounding area um, is very, very safe. And here at Rhodes, we've taken a good number of steps and invested quite a bit in campus safety. Uh, it is a gated community. Uh, we do have campus safety patrolling campus, uh, not just on, but also off campus, off campus on a 24-hour basis. So being in a city, I, I tell all who would listen to me. You know, cities have this thing called crime that happens at a higher clip than, let's say, you know, rural settings. And my own daughter attends a mega city where there's crime every second. And we tell our young people all the time, you have to be smart. You have to use common sense. Nothing good happens at 2 or 3 a.m. anywhere in America. Um, you have small communities. We've We've had a lot of really unfortunate news happened last fall where these small little communities are having to deal with incredible crime, right? Well, you know, that happens here in Memphis, but I can tell you that, you know, you have to understand, you know, what to do and what not to do and when to do certain things. You know, you always want to hang out with your buddies, do the buddy system. Uh, we tell young people all the time that, you know, you always want to be careful of your surroundings just because there are no guarantees out there. But for me, coming from a medium-sized city, and I grew up in Los Angeles. and Before that, I grew up in Manila. I can tell you that there's infinitely more crime in, in the mega cities than, than Memphis. But it's true. We, we do have crime here. and We want young people to be safe, our faculty to be safe, our students to be safe. Um, and our president particularly is very, very focused in making sure our students on and off campus are safe. And when we talk about safety, it's not just necessarily crime. You know, we had a snowstorm yet again here. Um, and I say yet again because it's happened in the last three years, which is not bad <laughs> relative to the rest of the country. But a snowstorm is a big deal here. Um, and, you know, because of the issues with the local provider with water, you know, well, we felt it unsafe for our students to be here in the rest hall. So we put them in hotels outside of Memphis. And we did this for a week uh, just to make sure our students are safe. Um, just because wow. if the water is not safe to drink or there's not enough water pressure, that can be a fire hazard. You know, we didn't want our students to have to deal with that. So, so safety is not just about crime, but also there's the elements. There's all those different things. And, you know, personal safety. We want our students, again, to feel good about their stay here. All right. Well, you knocked the ball out of the park on that one. Let's try the last one. And and um, so what would you say to the person that says, Rhodes is great, but the social scene is dominated by fraternities and sororities, and that's not my thing. And so I think it's a great school if someone wants to join a sorority or frat. But if if you don't want to join one, it may not be for you. What would you say to that person? Well, I, I can tell you that uh, there's 120 to 130 different clubs and organizations here, and not all of our students are Greek. There are some organizations that are not necessarily your you know, typical Greek organization. Some are more focused on, on, uh, on community work and community service and impacting the local area. So to me, if you are not interested in Greek, that's okay. Is it true that the majority of the parties are thrown by Greek organizations? That is true. 
you know, that, that is correct. But that said, you know, they invite students, non-Greeks, to their get-togethers also. So I think being in a smaller community, it's kind of easier for that to, to happen, where sometimes in a larger community, it, it's, it might be a little bit tougher just because we're talking volume. But in a smaller community, it's just easier to invite non-Greeks to your functions, for instance. So with that said, because we are a pretty diverse campus, I really value the fact that we try to do all that we can and celebrate all the different uh, populations on campus and the culture that they belong to and, or at least adhere to or identify with. So I love going to, for instance, you know, the, the Asian clubs would have events, our, our Black student associations would have events, you know, our Muslim students will have events, uh, our Jewish students will have events. So those are the kind of things that I make for, I think, for a vibrant campus where there's an opportunity for all types of students. And don't forget, Yo, gang, if that's, if that's not enough for you, the city of Memphis is right here. <laughs> there you go. There you go. There you go. So, Gil, this has been awesome, and I really appreciate you giving us 45 minutes of your time. What did we not ask? Is there anything uh, in closing you want to share that we didn't cover? And we covered a lot of ground. I can tell you that <laughs> much. You know, And I'm thinking about, my gosh, is there something that we didn't cover? I, I feel like on our end here, I, I do appreciate the fact that we just recently joined the American Talent Initiative. Uh, American Talent Initiative is basically comprised of so, some of the more sort of top national uh, public uh, universities and colleges. And basically all this group sponsored by, by Bloomberg Philanthropies, what we try to do is to continue to push the envelope for first generation, low income, moderate income families to put them in a position to these wonderful young people to realize a college education. And all of us, you know, more or less pledge that we'll do our bit individually to attract and enroll these students and graduate these students. And to me, philosophically, and I know this is my soapbox, you know, being a low income person, but also seeing the impact of higher education. In, in any kind of student, you know, it, and, but globally, there, there's that other piece that we often forget in that we're competing globally for everything. And I truly believe that America is truly going to be stronger when we have more people with some kind of post-secondary education or training. You know, we're, we are actually trailing so many countries in terms in, in that arena. We used to be number one back in the day, but now, you know, there's so many countries way ahead of us in terms of tertiary education, that, you know, we don't want to lose out. And we want all of our people to be contributing members of society, because we know that, you know, not only will college pay, but also society benefits, because we'll have, in many ways, we'll have better, uh, higher tax base, we'll have fewer crime, parents are going to be more involved with raising their children. So I am just basically drinking the Kool-Aid in terms of higher education and some kind of post-secondary training outside of high school, just because it makes us so much better as a country. Gil, thank you so much. And you were you survived the hot seat last time, so that's only one time. <laughs> you don't have to go through the lightning round. But um, I know our listeners, there are a lot of parents who love their kids and are very diligent about this process. They don't mind listening for three hours uh, to a podcast on Mondays and Thursdays, and they're the kinds of people that will be signing up. And so I'll work with you off air, but we'll nail some details down and we'll do a, a webinar like we did last time. And you can meet a bunch of uh, parents, students, and college counselors that want to that wanna talk more roads with you. I would love that. In fact, I'd love to just talk about college and how to make it happen and you know, certain things to expect because I'm a veteran now, you know, yes. having two kiddos go through the process. <laughs> so, you know, I have some street cred. They you know, got street I, I'm not cred. just talking to talk. I've had some experience and, and maybe a couple of really good tips for, for students sure. and parents out there. But I want to thank you for the opportunity, Mark. I really appreciate it. I can't wait to see you next month. Yes. You know, looking forward and I'm to gonna it. Make sure you're rocking some Rhodes gear. I'm going to do it. I, I I promise you I'll wear it. You give it to me, I'll wear it. So thank you so much for your time. And uh, I look forward to seeing you at Rhodes coming up here shortly. Thanks, Gil. Oh, that's going to be great. Look forward to it. Take care, man. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Friends, 
Gil is a man of his word. I'm sitting here editing this podcast and I'm wearing a road shirt. Came yesterday in the mail and a sweaty. So when Gil says he'll do something, he'll do it. And when he promises you, he's going to give you some tips. If you sign up for the information session he's doing for us, he's going to give you some tips. We encourage you to sign up. Once again, that'll be Sunday, March 3rd at 9.30 Eastern, 8.30 Central, 7.30 Mountain, and 6.30 Pacific. Just go to yourcollegeboundkid.com, go to the Events tab, and you'll see Rhodes Question and Answer Session. Go ahead and do yourself a favor. Sign up and start writing your questions down. And bring some tough ones for him, too. Friends, on Monday's episode, I want you to hear about how some colleges are really getting creative and they found a way to use test scores in their admission process in some innovative ways. So we'll be hearing some of the things that are out there, particularly in what's referred to as a no-harm testing policy. We'll also have the final part of Andy Boris, the VP of Enrollment at UGA. And Andy's interview explores reasons why students are heading south for college. Now, friends, last February, I gave you a number of quotes from famous Black Americans to celebrate Black History Month. And I meant to do that again, but I was thinking to myself, snap, it's February 22nd. That's a good time to remember that. So I'm going to give you one quote this week from Martin Luther King and one quote next week from Atlanta's own Martin Luther King. And here he said, and this is what King had to say. If you can't fly, then you run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, you have to keep moving. That is deep, and that applies to all of us in some capacity, in some way, in our lives. See you on Monday, friends. And that's our show. A big thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in this week. If you find this podcast helpful, please follow us and you'll get every single episode as soon as it is released. If you're interested, there are a few ways you can really support our podcast. You can click the share button and send it to your friends and acquaintances. You can help us pay our staff and our expenses by donating on our website. You can write a review for us on Apple or Spotify. I'm the producer of the podcast, but we have a fantastic team of 15. Shout out to our co-host, Dr. Lisa Ruff, Dr. David Williams, Linda Depker, Susan Tree, Vince Garcia, and Julia Esquivel. And to our substitute co-host, Sylvia Borgo. Our sensational sound engineer is Nemanja Motvich. Our amazing music is from Victor Allen Weeks. Marketing designs are from Kimberly Blass. Lily Parikh manages our Instagram. Our image editor is Talha Khan. Joyce Ducker does our website episode updates. And our webmaster is Stalianos Dimitru. And if you want to have a coaching session with Lisa, Linda, or me, just text me at 404-664-4340. If you have a question you want us to answer, or if you have a recommended resource or article you think we should discuss, just send it to questions at yourcollegeboundkid.com. Our favorite method is for you to record your own voice at speakpipe.com forward slash YCBK. By the way, check out our website where you'll find lots of content that is not on any podcast app. Our website is yourcollegeboundkid.com. If you want to learn about other hot admissions topics, follow us on Twitter at YCBK Podcast. We think of you as our listening family, and we look forward to meeting again with you every single Monday and Thursday.